Hey, welcome back after the break. I hope uh, all of you had a good break. We all had a good time. The in-person students had a good laugh outside. Uh, just took a short break outside. It was a good time. OK, we come back to our class and uh, continue from where we stopped. We were looking at the morning and the um, evening sacrifice. And we said that the lamb that was sacrificed uh, was made as the atonement sacrifice. It pointed out to Jesus Christ, uh, who made, uh, who became that animal that was that substitute in our place, took our place, died for our, uh, our sins, shed his blood, which atoned for our uh, sins. Okay. So the burnt offering, which is mentioned in this morning and evening sacrifice, it spoke of complete consecration which means the entire sacrifice was consumed by fire, was actually uh, consecrated to God. It was made holy uh, to God. And um, usually the meal offerings, the meal offerings, we're talking about the grain offering or the drink offering, okay, uh, consisted of what people gave us first fruits. You know, we all give tithes. A tithes as uh, you know to the Lord. Uh, so you in the in the Israelite community, part of the rituals they used to give the meal um, offering, which consisted of uh, grains and a drink offering, which was given as the first fruits. That means the first produce of their labor. Uh, we read about this in Leviticus chapter two, verse fourteen. So the a meal offering spoke of consecration of one's life and substance to God. So this morning and evening sacrifice was a type and shadow of what Jesus would do on the cross, the person and work, which means the person was the you know, perfect uh, one without sin, without any blemish, who was, was spotless, and would also make, would be a substitute in our place and make atonement for our sins. And also spoke of complete consecration in the terms of the, the meal offering, okay, which consisted of grains and the drink offering, basically to spoke about, you know, consecration of one's life. Okay, so it had to do with God and us as well. So you look at, uh, you know, any covenant that God makes, he makes it with man and also we are part of that covenant. Okay, even the new covenant, God has made that covenant, but we are coming into covenant with him. That means we are agreeing. We have to do our part. So, you know, uh, even if you look at the various promises in God's word, um, most of the promises that we read actually has a command, right? A command to follow it, then you will inherit that promise. So also here in these rituals that they had to make, people had to do it so that they would, they had to, God had to do his part, God did his part, and people also had to do their uh, part. So here the lamb was atoning for their sins, but people also had to, that was not just sufficient, but people also had to consecrate their lives. And I think this is so beautiful because God is saying that, you know, God knows that if you just give a lamb as a sacrifice, then these people will think, okay, the lamb was sacrificed. You, you won't feel a pinch of it, right? Because you are not paying the money for that lamb. The priest is taking the lamb that is growing or that is, you know, uh, raised up in the, in, in the for temple purposes. Uh, so you don't feel anything for your sin. But, you know, when you give your first fruits uh, as tithes, you're basically saying, God, I am consecrating my whole life and everything that I have belongs to you. So there is God's part and there is man's part as um, well. So... You know, Jesus made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice, and that is why we don't have to offer morning and evening sacrifices because he became that perfect um, lamb. Look at what uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27 says, and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. Can somebody read, please? Hebrews 7, verse 26 and 27. For such a high priest was fitting for us, Fighting for us, who is holy, harmless. Not fighting was fitting for fitting. us. Okay. Yes. 
fitting fitting for us who is holy harmless undefiled 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 separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to office to offer a offer up sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the peoples for this he did once for all when he offered up himself yes thank you amen so here we see that you know the book of hebrew says that you know the high pri the priest does not need to offer any more um, daily sacrifices for the sins of the people because it was already offered up by jesus him so hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 and 12 and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeat, repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So isn't that amazing that, you know, every day they had to offer the morning and evening sacrifice. Why? Because every day, even as they offer the morning and evening sacrifice, you know, that sacrifice was just for that day. It would not, could not be atoned for the next day. It could not be atoned for one week. It could not be atoned for one month. Okay? Because it could never take away the sins entirely of people. But this man, who is he talking about this man? The man, Jesus Christ. Okay? After he had offered up sins, um, for, you know, he sat at the right hand of the Father because he offered up sins once for all. So, you know, the, the sin was atoned for in the eyes of God, in the presence of God the Father. The sin was atoned for permanently and, um, you know, no more sacrifices was required or no more sacrifices was um, and needed okay and why could jesus do this he was because holy harmless undefiled separate from uh, sinners okay and also why was jesus able to make this full sufficient perfect sacrifice because he was one with the father which means he was fully surrendered totally uh, totally and completely surrendered his will his life to the father and hence he was that sinless lamb who made that um, uh, sacrifice uh, as our substitute that could end the morning and evening sacrifice okay jesus is also known as the suffering lamb so can um, uh, francis can you read that please isaiah chapter 53 7 and 10 7 to 10 please loudly and then rin can read first peter chapter 2 verses 21 to 24 Isaiah 53, 7, 7 to 10. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgress, tran, transgressions of my people, he was not Verse 9. And there is Because he had done so much, no one is it the Lord should him. He has put him to give. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pressure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, thank you. Amen to that. Uh, can Rin please read First Peter chapter two, verse twenty-one to twenty-four? For to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. 
who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. So here we see that, um, you know, Jesus, who became that lamb, that sinless lamb, that, you know, atoned for our sins, who was our substitute as a sinless lamb, it was not something that was an easy place to do or to take, right? It was not an easy position. It was not just being that lamb who was not going to suffer because, you know, he was, yes, he was complete human, human, completely divine. So, you know, maybe when he became that, uh, came to the point where he had to take the sins of the entire world, you know, he became God. And so he didn't have to go through all that suffering and pain. No, he went through everything as a perfect human being. And just as a lamb would suffer when it was sacrificed, so also Jesus, you know, um, uh, became that suffering lamb, which means the, the, the punishment for our sin was not easy for him to take. First of all, for the sinless person to take on the sins of the world was so uh, difficult, was so painful, and also the suffering that he went through uh, physically. And so these verses say that he was oppressed, and if afflicted, okay, that means he was, um, he had gone through various sufferings, he went through various, uh, uh, he was tormented, he went through various difficulties. Uh, when he was reviled, that means when he was criticized strongly, when unpleasant things were said to him, you know, um, when they spat at him, when they kicked him, when they beat him, you know, um, he did not retaliate. That means he did not revile in return. That means he did not say unpleasant things or he did not react in, an, uh, in, a, in, in a way that would criticize others or he did not say things that criticize others as well. So we see that even as Jesus was that suffering lamb, you know, it describes how he was that suffering lamb. He was a suffering lamb who willingly suffered. Okay. What is that? Okay, he willingly suffered for our sins and he, you know, passively, which means, you know, without speaking up, without saying anything, just bore the penalty for our sin, just bore the punishment for our sin. Okay, so as a human being, Jesus suffered, he was a suffering lamb, he was oppressed and afflict afflicted, and he took upon our sufferings willingly. Okay, he bore the penalty very passively uh, for our sins. And he says he was stricken for the transgression of the people, which means it was the will of the Lord that Jesus was bruised. It was God's will that Jesus be, um, you know, punished, uh, be bruised, be afflicted, uh, because he had to pay for the punishment or the penalty for our uh, sin. So look at these verses. It says, what is the purpose of his suffering? The purpose of his suffering is to make his soul an offering for sin. Please look at your notes so that you are following through. Okay, it makes sense as well. Okay, so what was the purpose of the suffering lamb or what was the purpose of Jesus' suffering so that he can make his soul as an offering for sin? Okay, he can make his soul, which knew no sin, which was sinless, which was perfect, he can make it as an offering for a sin. Now, this word offering in Hebrew means trespass offering. Okay, now what does it mean? Word uh, trespass mean? The word trespass means guilt. Okay, so what is the meaning of guilt? Guilt means basically, um, you know, disobedience. It also means uh, violating somebody's rules, orders. When do you feel guilty? You feel guilty when you have broken a rule, when you have fallen short of a standard or a rule or a commandment or a law that is there, you feel guilty. You also feel guilty when you disobey, right? Uh, when you go against what God has asked you to do. It also means violating, which means, you know, destroying or disobeying the rights of 
others. So you feel guilty when you uh, do that, you know, when you disobey uh, uh, and also when you violate the rights of others, whether it's the God's right or man's right. So when Christ became that suffering lamb that he so that he could take uh, make his life as an offering for our sin, he actually became that guilt offering. He actually became that trespass offering. Trespass offering means what? Guilt offering. Okay. So we find, um, you know, this trespass offering defined for us in Leviticus chapter 5, verses 14 uh, to chapter 6, verse 7, and Numbers chapter 5, verses 7 and um, 8. So, can just one of you read? Numbers chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, because that is much shorter. We can just read that. Can one of you quickly read Numbers 5, 7 and 8, please? Then he shall con confess the sin which he has committed. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full, plus one-fifth of it, and give it to the one he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution restitution may be made for the wrong the restitution for the wrong must go to the lord for the priest in addition to the ram of the atonement with which atonement is made for him so here is basically saying that when you kind of do something against your neighbor you know when you kill their animal or you you know take their property or you damage their property whatever you have to make a trespass offering and what does that trespass offering include it includes restitution. That means you have to pay back or buy back or give back what you have, you know, kind of destroyed your neighbor's property or whoever's property or whosoever uh, animal or whatever thing that you have taken and destroyed. You have to pay back. You have to replace it. So the trespass offering also required restitution. So that means an individual had to cover the damages uh, in addition to making the animal sacrifice. So here, the person had to make an animal sacrifice and also had to pay back, had to restore. The restitution had to be uh, made. So the trespass offering not only involved making atonement, which means that you make the animal sacrifice, which atone for your sin, but God is saying, hey, pay back. And the restitution has to go back to the temple right that goes back to god that's what you read right rin yeah so here we see that you know uh, it the, it had to the trespass offering involved a, uh, making atonement which had that ram as a sacrifice and also social restitution for the wrong that had been done so when jesus became that suffering lamb he was our trespass offering which means he May not only made the sacrifice for the atonement for our sin, but he also had to pay back what we had violated God's law, God's standard, God's glory, and you know, whatever we uh, how we violated the laws and commandments and the rights of God. So he had to also make a uh, restitution. So Christ became that trespass offering where he made a restitution by. The payment for the sinner's um, uh, offering by paying back the debt to a holy God who had been violated. Okay, so when Jesus made that trespass offering, he also made restitution, which means he paid back the debt to whom? To God the Father, who was a holy God. Why? Because we had violated the commandments, we had violated God's right, okay, and what he had asked us to. Uh, do okay and because we violated God's standard his his law you know it required that we compensate we pay back in order for this holy God to be satisfied in order for us to be reconciled back to this holy God in order for us to be justified before this holy God not only had there to be made atonement for our sin but also restitution that means the debt had to be paid back. So you see how much Jesus has really done for us on the cross. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. Can one of you read that, please? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also 
that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. There. Okay. So he suffered outside the gate. That means where was Jesus when he was crucified? He was crucified outside the city, right? Outside the gates of the city. So outside of the uh, city. So he suffered outside the gates. That's, you know, it shows that the bodies of the animals which were offered as a sacrifice were burnt outside the sanctuary. So when we are studying or looking at Jesus, who was the sacrificial lamb, who was a sinless lamb, and see how, you know, he made the sacrifices, uh, how the sacrifices in the Old Testament clearly spoke or specifically spoke about the various aspects of the person and the work of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, it's also important for us to see that, you know, uh, Jesus not only made that perfect atonement for our sacrifice, not only made that perfect restitution that was the death that was needed for our sin, but also he went through so much of shame and disgrace. He suffered, not only suffered physically, but also, you know, he was crucified outside the gates, outside the uh, city. And, the, you know, the Old Testament law, uh, you know, Jews believe that anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed, right? So Jesus became our curse. He took upon our curse and he went through that curse and he suffered for us so that we can receive the blessing, so that we can be justified, we can be made righteous for um, God. So it's important for us to see that, you know, everything that God actually initiated or brought about in the Old Testament, whether it's the rituals, the sacrifices, whether it's the feast, the ceremonies, were all actually foreshadowing or it was actually a type and shadow of the person and the work of the coming of the Messiah or the Son of God or the Lamb of God that take, came to take away the sins of our, uh, of the sins of the entire mankind or the sins of the entire world okay so even though there are so many things that we can see in the old testament we see everything has been fulfilled and completed in the person and work of jesus christ amen okay uh, before we go on to the lamb uh, of uh, the lamb of revelation the, or the lamb that is referred to in the book of revelation Yes. Um, Pastor, relating to um, the sacrifices that the people of the Israelites made for their sins. So if um, so, you were saying like if they did not um, sacrifice, they would suffer the wrath of God for their sin. I mean, so uh, I mean, had the sin. Um, have to be so great in order for them to sacrifice, or was it like for just big sins, not for like small island. Oh, there were sins like the rebellion of Korah, then there was uh, a, a Miriam kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, talking against um, uh, Moses. There were people that the, the sins of the people who rebelled uh, when they, you know, when they didn't have water to drink, uh, mana, and also the the 12 spies, Numbers chapter 12, um, and all of that, you know, we see that, you know, God punishing them uh, there, then and there itself. Uh, didn't wait for, you know, uh, atonement for that sin. They were just, they were just, you know, the earth opened up or they had a plague where they all died or, you know, God sent fiery serpents among them and they were killed. So there were some, uh, some things that were so grievous um, sins against God when they complained, when they murmured, when you know, like Achan, Achan, when God told um, uh, the Israelites that you're going to fight against um, Jericho city, but none of you have to take any plunder from there. Every plunder, every gold and silver has to go into the uh, the tent of meeting. But we see Achan disobeyed, and then God pulled him out of all the you know uh, Israelite ray, the son, and he was taken to the valley where he and his whole family were stoned. That time there was, God didn't say you pay or make atonement for sin. There's sometimes when there is um, you know, direct rebellion, direct um, disobedience, a direct breaking of the law, In uh, even though they know that it was wrong or directly, you know, going against God, 
when you know god would punish them and of course when, when moses stood up and he intervened you know god would have mercy upon them but there are other sins where you know god would just let them uh, make those sacrifices and yes uh, you know their sins were atoned for yeah i'm saying like um, they not everyone had someone um, to be accountable for not everyone had someone to be accountable for i mean what if they did it where no one knew about it oh yeah. what if they did not know it was a sin and they did not uh, make that sacrifice that is what you're saying no 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 hmm. i'm telling like for those who did it um without having accountability like they were doing it without anyone seeing it they were doing a sin without anyone seeing them or noticing them on yeah so that time you're saying that they they, they did not make any sacrifice for sin what would happen to them yeah i'm saying yeah what about those people yeah they would be punished for their sin you know that's what god tells them in numbers chapter 32 was 23 i think it is numbers chapter 32 was 23 Um, yeah, he says, and be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers chapter thirty-two, verse twenty-three. So God repeatedly is saying that uh, you know He knows their sin. Why does He even you know bring out their sin? Because He's saying, hey, you can't cover your sin with me. Achan thought nobody knew, right? He brought that. that that robe he bought uh, silver gold he hid it in his tent in the ground nobody other than his wife and children know but what did god do he pulled him out right he said next day have all the tribes stand out and i will choose the uh, tribe i'll choose the clan i'll choose the family and akin was chosen so you know uh, did akin have the opportunity to uh, you know ask forgiveness for his sins yes did he no why he thought god was so foolish he would not know he would not point him out or it somebody else in there not him so what was god doing when he brought out akin and he tells the people uh, go and bring everything that akin owned his wife children his animals everything and stone them to death why wife and children because they knew his sin they could have spoken up So he says God is telling them that you know I see your sin I know your sin but you know don't cover your sin you know uh, 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 make that sacrifice that can atone for your sin or ask for forgiveness so it's not only in the old testament even for us now right um, there are times when we think nobody knows our sin but you know God is speaking to us he tells us and what happens when we when we keep overlooking our sin a sin will find us at one point day we will be brought out in the open and that time it will be bring a lot of shame and disgrace and no one can save us but is god giving us chance and opportunity yes so did that help answer your question yeah okay um what about ch children what about children yeah uh, what about did they have to also make sacrifices the children have to make sacrifices I mean, for their sins like for their sins actually it doesn't uh, mention anywhere in the old testament that uh, you know um, that children have to make sacrifices for their sins it's it's basically talking about adults so when when they grow up to that stage where they are adults and they know they have to make sacrifices for their sins and they would begin doing that yeah also their parents would make for them yes yeah for those you know those times when they had to you know be taken to the uh, to the temple after their their birth they would take that dove just like mary and joseph did for baby jesus sorry job is to do for his children they were all grown up at that time they were not children per se children they were all grown up adults and so they used to have parties and they would sin so he would as a father be scared for them because you know and he would make a, a sacrifice for their sins but they were all grown up kids yeah
Not kids, grown-up children. Yeah, one question. Can you give him the mic, please? Uh, are uh, uh, online student anyone has any questions? No questions. Yes. Can you keep it and speak loud, please? Put it on. It's on the mic. It's not on. Okay. Yes. Yes. They you they had to sacrifice a ram. They would sacrifice a bull. They would sacrifice. Um, you know, a heifer also when when God asked Abraham to make that uh, covenant sacrifice, uh, dove as well. So a lamb basically would mean atonement for their uh, uh, for their for the sins of the entire community would uh, would would mean uh, a lamb. Okay. Uh, other places where they used ram and all, but the one we read in uh, Leviticus chapter, um, right? Um, which the, the portion that you read, right? It speaks about a ram there, right? That is making restitution for your sin and you harm somebody else, okay? Numbers chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 talking about restitution. So you look at Leviticus chapter 5, there's another uh, reference there. Leviticus chapter 5, uh, verses 14 onwards. There also says a ram, uh, you know, uh, the Lord, his trespass offering a ram, ram without blemish from, from the flocks. So again, maybe when you're talking about trespass offering, which is talking about, you know, when you have to make restitution for somebody else, that time you offer ram. But basically, when you're making uh, atonement for the sins, you would uh, talk about a lamb. Yes. Yes, yes. He it could be for any other sin offering that they would have done, a trespass offering or anything else, or consecration, like when, um, <clears throat> sorry, when um, King Solomon consecrated the temple, offered so many goats and uh, rams and, you know, <clears throat> sheep and all of that. So, different offerings. <laughs> Oh, you mean according to the social standing, whether they, whether it's a ram or a lamb or a bull, you're talking about that? Hmm. Yes. No, no, they see the, the entire sacrificial system was fully in place by, by God. He told them what offering for which sin. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, Leviticus, um, you know, the whole thing is talking about sacrifices. Okay. Every sacrifice had details, like even how much of him of oil you know, shekels of flour, everything had its own place. So you can't rest, you can't substitute one in place of the other. Yes. Any questions from our um, online students? No? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on. Okay. Uh, the Lamb of Revelation. Now, we've basically been looking at uh, Jesus as the sinless Lamb in connection with the... Uh, you know, his person and the person and work of Jesus when he lived here on this earth. In that connection, what he has done, we're looking at him as the sinless lamb and looking at him as somebody who's foreshadowing or the type and shadow of everything that was ordained in the 
uh, in the Old Testament. But when you look at Jesus as a lamb in Revelation, it is something that he is, you know, it's a place that he is, uh, where he is, where he's already completed the work. The work is completed, the work is done, and now he is, uh, you know, the right hand of the Father. And uh, we look at various references in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, Revelation chapter 14, verses 1, 9, and 7, 10, Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 to 14, that talks about the Lamb of um, God. So when we're talking about the Lamb of God in Revelation, it can seem a little out of context from what we've been studying, because we've basically been studying the person and work of Jesus Christ as a human being and what he accomplished and what he came to fulfill everything that was done or spoken of or uh, you know, uh, as a ritual is done in the Old Testament. Now we are looking at some, he, him as, uh, you know, um, as a glorified uh, deity back in his uh, position, you know, and uh, so, you know, we can be, it's, it's not him as a sinless lamb anymore, but here as a glorified lamb of God. Here as somebody who's won the victory, somebody who is, um, um, you know, conquered, who's triumphant, who's victorious, the King of Kings, uh, the Lord of Lords. Okay. So now, why are we looking at it? We're just kind of studying a parallel. Okay. Uh, just looking at it. Uh, of course, it can seem out of context, but uh, because he is no longer the incarnate Son, he is no longer as a Lamb of God who's uh, come to make that. Um, uh, you know, the suffering Lamb of God that came to take upon the sins of the world. Uh, but here he is somebody who is pictured as that triumphant, victorious, and overcoming uh, conqueror. But it's good for us to see it even as we are studying this Jesus as the Lamb. We studied him as the incarnate, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, the man who became that uh, sinless Lamb, that suffering Lamb. We'll also look at him as that, being that lamb who is now glorified, uh, who is that triumphant, victorious uh, King of Kings and uh, Lord of Lords. So in um, the, the book of Revelation, there are 28 references uh, made to Jesus as the lamb. Okay. Uh, and what I have just mentioned here in the verses that I have spoken about is just a few verses, but there are 28 um, uh, references um, you know, so uh, Jesus here in Revelation, he is no longer pictured as that passive. You know, the meaning of passive means when he was that lamb, that sinless lamb uh, of God, when he was that suffering lamb here on this earth, he was passive. It means he just took on all the shame. He took on all that beating. He took on all that criticism. And, um, you know, he he took on all that suffering that was inflicted on him. He very quietly, passively, not doing anything about it, just took it upon himself. And he was that submissive Lamb of God and that that suffering Lamb of God, even as he was here on this earth. Okay, But if you look at him as um, the one in Revelation, he's no longer seen as that passive, suffering, uh, submissive Lamb of God, but he's seen as somebody who's triumphed over death, who's triumphed over Satan, who has been victorious over sin, death, and Satan, who has been victorious over um, every work of the enemy, who, is, who has done the will of the Father, and now he is that overcome, uh, overcome, uh, you know, overcoming conqueror who has conquered um, everything. So it's um, interesting to see these two aspects of it because Jesus is still spoken of as the, as the lamb in the book of Revelation, the lamb who's worthy to take the seal, uh, the scroll, break the seal, you know, uh, the lamb of God who is, uh, uh, you know, who is uh, here we see in Revelation chapter 17, it says, um, these will make the war, the kings of the, uh, uh, the kings with the beast will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. Revelation chapter 17 verse 12 and 14. Um, then we look at Revelation chapter 14 verses 1, 9, 
um, and 10, where we see uh, John saying, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion with 140,000 having his father's name written on, on their foreheads. Then a third of the angels followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships a beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation and they will be tormented. So uh, tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb okay so jesus is again and again and again referred to as the lamb in revelation which can also mean that this is the lamb who made that perfect sacrifice who is triumphant who has conquered and it's important for us as people who are reading the scripture or reading the gospel for us to know hey this lamb not just suffered and died but this lamb and some people say he's resurrected but this lamb is actually the lamb that is seated at the right hand of god and he is the lamb who's going to come back we are going to uh, see this lamb he is going to be triumphant he is going to win over his enemies he is going to um, uh, put his enemies to uh, shame to put them into torment so when it's talking about the lamb it's actually talking about the continued work the finished work the triumphant work on jesus and how he is now you know um, back in his place and as a triumphant king of kings and the lord of lords and as god which is so important for us to know so um uh, when God is revealing all of these things through visions to uh, John, he could have just showed him as Jesus and he could have just mentioned Jesus rather than mentioning the lamb. But it's so important for the Jewish audience to know that this Messiah who they think is cursed, who died on the cross, and they're looking and anticipating for this Messiah where the Bible or the scripture is telling them this truth that, hey, Actually, this Messiah is God. He came from God. He's gone back to God. And you will see this Messiah as the Lamb coming back. So this is that Lamb of um, God. So even if Jesus was not the is not the uh, in human form in heaven, but still talking about his role as the Lamb because of what he has finished and what he has conquered and what he has um, done. Okay. So if you look at the other references as well, it talks about. Um, how he took the seal, uh, the scroll, broke the seals, and all of those things. And, uh, you know, there was a loud voice um, in heaven uh, saying that, you know, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive honor and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and as such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard them saying, blessing and honor, glory and power, to be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever so why don't why don't why don't they say be to the one who sits on the throne which is talking about god the father and to jesus christ why does it talk about the lamb because it is so important for the jewish people to know hey this was the lamb who was sacrificed who is the lamb who is now seated at the right hand of god this is the lamb who said that you know i have come from my father and i go i will go back to my uh, father this is the lamb the same lamb of god so it's so important uh, for people to identify jesus continuously as the lamb of god who is the triumphant king and the lord of lords who is going to come back and uh, the one who's going to come back is the lamb of god so isn't that a very beautiful kind of ending to the whole of um, scripture right where it talks about begins with in the garden of eden where the lamb was slain that atoned for that covered the sin of adam and eve right up till the end in revelation where it's continuing to talk about the lamb of course the new old testament is talking about the person work of jesus christ in the gospels we see this lamb of god and in revelation we know that this lamb is in heaven and is the lamb that was going to come back and uh, rule and reign on this earth and also uh, judge the people okay so um this is the last section of that um, you know the whole part of this lesson um now if we look at um, you know the apocalyptic uh, literature in the bible 
uh, it views the lamb no longer as a passive, submissive, suffering sacrifice, but one who is a triumphant uh, king. Okay, so um, uh, you know, in apocalyptic literature, in uh, you know, for example, the book of Joel or uh, the book of Zechariah, uh, you know, Isaiah chapters 24 to uh, 27 and 33 uh, are all apocalyptic. Okay, a literature which basically is talking about what is apocalyptic is basically describing or prophesying, you know, complete destruction of the world coming the end apocalyptic. Okay, destruction of the entire world. So it's uh, and it talks about, you know, the, the lamb who's going to come and destroy everything and bring everything back to purpose and create new heavens and, you know, a new earth and all of those things. So. Uh, apocalyptic literature we see in the book of Joel, Zechariah, Daniel, uh, and Isaiah as well. But it's talking about you know the, how the whole world will come to complete uh, destruction. We also have some of these ap apocalyptic literature which is not part of the canon, which is not part of the Bible, uh, where it is the apocalypse of Baruch or a couple, a couple, apocalypses of uh, Ezra or of John or uh, Ascension of uh, Isaiah, which are all, you know, uh, kind of pseudographia books, which means, you know, um, uh, there are some literature, biblical literature, uh, you know, which is not according to biblical style and not, you know, attributing to biblical authorship, um, you know, as some of the Bible characters, but they, some people still look at these as, uh, you know, biblical literature, but it's not. Uh, so they are called as pseudographia, and that is why it's not included in our Bible. But all of these pseudographia books, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, you know, written by various authors, and they attribute themselves to some biblical character because they want their books to be known and to be attributed to as something that is, you know, inscribed, inspired by the Holy Spirit and authoritative. You know, they use these pseudo names, but it was not in, uh, included in the Bible because they did not follow that canon rules that were laid down for which books have to be uh, in the Bible and which shouldn't be. So, but we see that even in these books, you know, there's a lot of apocalyptic literature which talks about the lamb who is going to come as a victorious king, triumphant king, and he is going to uh, destroy uh, the whole world. But it's amazing to see, actually, if you look at um, the lamb that is uh, the, the Greek word, please listen carefully, the, the Greek word used for lamb in John chapter 1 verse 29, okay, which we looked at in the beginning of our lesson, uh, is very different from the, the, the Greek word used for lamb in the book of Revelation. So the Greek word used for lamb in John chapter 1 verse 29, where, where John says, you know, the Lamb of God, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Lamb that is used there is basically uh, amnos, which means sacrificial lamb. So when you read it in Greek, you read it as amnos, and you say, so John is basically saying, if you, if you translate it, look, the sacrificial lamb of God, if you literally translate it, okay? Um, um, but if you look at in the Revelation, the Greek word there is not amnos, it's not sacrificial lamb, but the Greek word used there is anion, which means little lamb, okay, which means a Passover lamb, little, little, L-I-T-T-L-E. -T -T -E. It means little lamb, which means a very innocent little lamb, okay, um, uh, which is basically talking about the Passover um, lamb. So here we see that, you know, um, um, even though the lamb is used in the Gospels, but it's very interesting to note that the Greek word for lamb used in John chapter 1 verse 29 is very different from the Greek word that's used for a revelation, because the one that is used in revelation, basically the little lamb means the lamb who is the king of kings and the lord of lords and not used as a sacrificial lamb. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful to uh, learn that as well. Okay, we'll stop here. Our time is up. 
uh, end of this chapter. Anyone has any questions to ask? Any questions? Uh, so since we have completed, uh, you know, um, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, when can we have our next um, uh, assessment? I think assessment 2 is March 10, right? Uh, lessons 5 to 8. Is that okay with everyone? Online students? March 10, is that okay? We are already past Mar March 10th, right? Yeah. What are we doing? What am I doing? I've written here March. Oh, yeah, I've forgotten it. Okay. Okay, I uh, just realized that I basically have forgotten about uh, the second assessment, which I had to schedule <laughs> March 10th. So online students, can you give me another date, please? Can you give me another date? Because I had to schedule your second assessment on March 10, which I completely uh, missed and forgot. Um, so can we have another date? Anyone can propose another date quickly? Anyone has a calendar? Online students? March 20th. OK, March 20th is. Uh, March 20th is Monday. Is that okay with everybody else? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anthony and Prabhu and Jackin. Uh, I hope it's okay with the others. I'm so sorry. I completely missed March 10th. I, I think I didn't write that in my calendar, and so I completely missed it out. Okay. We'll have our um, next assessment chapters um, 5, 6, 7, 8 on March 20th. Okay. Uh, any questions or any doubts or anything before we leave class? Anyone? No? Okay, thank you all for joining class. Have a good day and a good week ahead. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Sorry? Yeah. Stop recording. One minute.